Today we move to a new phase in the course. So-called clause methods make up a big part of computational logic and it will take several lectures to cover everything we need to cover. I mentioned early on that our logical language is redundant, containing a lot of symbols that are not strictly needed, shall we say, for a minimal calculus for expressing what we want, um, but are aiming to be readable, and that we need to compile down to some simplified form if we want to apply certain efficient algorithms. Clause form is one such compiled form. It's very simple. A clause is nothing but a disjunction of literals, where a literal, remember, is either an atomic formula, that is simply a predicate symbol, or the negation of a predicate symbol. So here we have typical form of any clause is simply a disjunction of some negated literals. These are called negative literals. Also perhaps including some positive literals. Of course, it's possible for M or N or both to be zero. We can write this clause. There are in a variety of other notations. They are quite often written as sets. So simply this set of literals, both negative and positive. One can also write them using an arrow, so-called Kowalski notation. Note that with the arrow notation, the not signs disappear. With the fact of having the arrowhead pointing towards you means you are a positive literal. And if the arrow is going away from you, then you are a negative literal. So all four clauses shown here on the slide are in fact identical. I mentioned it's possible for m and n to equal zero when we get the empty clause, which is sometimes written as a box. So the empty disjunction, remember, is equivalent to false, and that expresses a contradiction. We are doing proof by contradiction. There are two main clause form methods, the so-called SAT solving methods and resolution proving methods. This first lecture on clause form will introduce both of them, but we will need to develop them both a bit further in future lectures. They both have the following general outline. So we begin with some formula A that we would like to prove, but we will prove it by contradiction. So we immediately affix a negation sign. This incidentally is a rather horrible error to make on an exam question. That is, if you, when answering the question, forget this negation phase, all the rest of your work will be wasted. Don't do it. Anyhow, you negate the formula you're trying to prove, then you convert it to conjunctive normal form, as we've seen already. You then have a conjunction of formulas each of which is a disjunction of literals. That is to say, every one of those formulas, A1 up to AM, is a clause. So transformation into CNF is the same thing as transformation into clause form, at least for propositional problems, which is our focus in this lecture. Now, both clause form methods that is to say, SAT-solving type methods and resolution methods, involve further transformations of the set of clauses. Up until now, we have only considered transformations that preserve the meaning. But here, we are only concerned with preserving satisfiability. That is to say, the presence or absence of models. If we manage in transforming the clause set to deduce the empty clause, then we've shown unsatisfiability. 
the empty clause, of course, being false, there is no model that can satisfy it. If then we can show the empty clause, we have shown a contradiction. Therefore, we have refuted not A, and therefore we have proved A as a theorem. Now, just to confuse you, as an alternative to deducing the empty clause, we may find ourselves with an empty set of clauses. That would mean that somehow in our processing of the clauses, we threw some away for some reason or another, and finally found that we've thrown away all the clauses. Well, the empty set is trivially satisfiable by any model. In this case, not A is satisfiable, and the original formula A is not a theorem after all. It's worth devoting a moment to why there has been so much work on clause methods. Back in 1930, Jacques Lebrand proved in his thesis um, his famous theorem, which gives an, apparently an algorithm for reducing first order logic to propositional logic. So apparently the possibility, at least the prospect of taking arbitrary formulas written in first order logic, reducing them to propositional formulas, and finally obtaining finite proofs of them by an algorithm, so a purely automatic mathematician. This was a very enticing prospect. What's interesting is that how many of the people who looked into this were proper philosophers, the sort of philosophers who wrote essays and books. So Quine and Putnam in particular are famous as the sort of philosophers who would write such essays. We had other methods at our disposal, so the sequent calculus could deal with quantifiers, but it turns out if you give it anything big, you get exponential growth very quickly, and it's completely infeasible. Another approach, based on Herbrand's theorem, was to detect unsatisfiability by converting formulas into disjunctive normal form. You may recall from the second lecture that you can detect tautologies by converting formulas to conjunctive normal form. If you convert them to disjunctive normal form instead, you can detect contradictory formulas by a purely dual argument. However, it takes exponential time, so it is really infeasible. Next along came the Davis, Putnam, and DPLL approaches, which we will look at in this lecture. At the time, people were really interested in quantifiers and Herbrand's theorem. They soon discovered that the Davis, Putnam methods were not good enough for those. So this looked, back in the early 60s, it looked like a dead end. As things happened, they roared back in the 90s. But starting in 1965, a rather different approach known as resolution was proposed by Alan Robinson, who, in, in fact, who coined the interesting terms resolution along with unification as the key to handling quantifiers. And that set the stage for a major branch of automated theorem proving. While we are talking in general terms, let's look at the question of why we say that a contradiction proves anything. Because after all, proof by contradiction is the basis of the methods we're looking at now. Once in a philosophy lecture, a student challenged Bertrand Russell on this very point, And he asked this simple question, let's suppose one equals zero, prove that you are the Pope. Bertrand Russell is, sa is said to have replied as follows, that in if one equals zero, then two equals one, 
we can now form the set containing Bertrand Russell and the Pope. It's a two-element set, but two equals one. Therefore, it's a one-element set, and therefore Bertrand Russell and the Pope are the same person. One problem with this answer, I suppose, is it sounds too much like a joke, although it isn't. So I have a second example as to what happens if you work in a formal theory of arithmetic. This works with any kinds of numbers, including the complex numbers that satisfy the usual algebraic laws. So if a and b are integers, for example, and 1 equals 0, then we can immediately prove that a equals b, as you can see in the derivation on the slide. So a equals b for all a and b. We also obtain 0 less than 0 because 0 is less than 1 and 1 equals 0. Therefore 0 is less than 0 and by similar reasoning we get a less than b for all a and b and so forth. So in this simpler language purely of arithmetic, we find that from the contradiction 1 equals 0, we can deduce that absolutely all relations are true and the whole system collapses. Now, getting back to the course content, the original Davis-Putnam method is not covered here. It was refined by Logeman and Loveland, and this is the method which has been used ever since. It is known as DPLL. And it has the following four steps. So remember, we begin with the framework I gave you already. We have negated a problem. We have converted it into conjunctive normal form. And now we come in with a set of clauses. The first thing to do is to look at your clauses and see if there are any um, obvious tautologies in them, such as P or not P, those clauses can be thrown away. The next thing to do, and let me stress, our method here is trying to find a model for the clauses. So if it succeeds, it will find a model. So this is success, but this success means that your original theorem or wished for theorem is in fact not a theorem because the model you find is a model of not A. It is a counterexample for A. Now back to the algorithm. If among your clauses you have a unit clause, meaning a clause containing just one single literal, then you delete all the clauses containing L as a literal, including the clause itself that you started with. In all the other clauses, you delete not L. The point here is that we have deduced that the literal L is true. Knowing that L is true, we are no longer interested in other clauses containing L, simply because, remember, a clause is disjunctive, it says L or other stuff, and we know now that L is true. The third step is to delete, to delete all clauses containing pure literals. Now, what is a pure literal? It's a literal that has the same sign in all the clauses. So imagine we have some literal P, and in our set of clauses, however huge it may be, P always occurs positively and is never negated. Remember, we're looking for models of the clauses to satisfy all the clauses. If P is never negated, then in searching for a model, we will simply set P to true. Uh, this cannot harm us because, as mentioned, there are no negated instances of P. So setting P to true will make a lot of clauses true without in any way affecting other clauses. The effect of setting P to true is that all those clauses become redundant and we can delete them. Exactly the same reasoning holds if every occurrence of P has a negation sign in front of it. Now for step four, 
And step four is in fact the step we have to do most often. If none of the easy cases apply, so which means in particular that the, all the clauses we have contain at least two literals, then we pick some literal and do a case split. A case split means we consider two possibilities. Either, let's call the literal P. We assume P is true and we work out the entire algorithm for the case where P is true. So if you like, we pretend there's a unit clause for P and then we run the entire algorithm. Um, if we get a model under the assumption P is true, then we have found a model. Remember, if we have found a model, we have actually disproved the original formula that we were trying to prove. If we don't find a model for P, then we do the whole thing again with not P. And again, if we find a model under the assumption not P, then we have in fact found a model. I should remark, I've described this all in terms of proving some formula A, which we then negate and convert not A to clauses. It is, of course, possible to apply DPLL to a set of clauses you've got from somewhere where you don't particularly have an original formula A in mind. In that case, we view it simply as a model finder. DPLL gives us a decision procedure, that is to say, given any original formula that we begin with, which is necessarily a propositional formula, DPLL only works for propositional logic, then it will either find a contradiction or it will find a model. And it can do this remarkably quickly. Here's a small example. I hope you'll recognize this formula as one we have seen a couple of times before starting, I guess, in the second lecture. And again, you might want to compare our treatment of this formula to previous treatments of this formula using the sequent calculus and, and conversion to conjunctive normal form. So here, what we have to do is convert, is to negate this thing and convert it to clauses. I skipped some steps. I'm sorry, you see, if this were a live lecture, what I would do at, the mo at this moment is to switch to the other projector and work this out by hand. I would tell you that to negate this thing, which is an implication, you should assume the first part to be true and negate the second part. Assuming P or Q to be true gives you the clause P comma Q immediately because, remember, clauses are disjunctive. When we negate the second part, which is a disjunction, we get not Q and not P. So when you get in the ha into the hang of this, you can convert an implication like this into clause form with no fuss at all. Now here are our clauses. What can we do with them? Well, there are many possibilities, but I think you may as well follow my slide here. We note that Q is a unit clause. Remember what you do with a unit clause is you delete all clauses containing that literal. In this case, we delete the not Q clause and you delete all occurrences of Q from the other clauses. The effect here, it gives us these two clauses. Now what do we do? We have P and we have not R. Both of them are unit clauses. In fact, both of them are pure literals. Remember, for a pure literal, we have P occurring positively and it never occurs negatively. R is also a pure literal. It occurs negatively, but it never occurs positively. It turns out the effect, whether we do a unit resolution or deletion of a pure literal, in, these trivial, in this trivial example, the result is the same. We have deleted all the clauses. So, and this 
empty sub clauses is trivially satisfiable. If we follow the route it took to get here, we set p to true here, we set q to false here, we set r to false there. And this indeed gives us a counterexample to the original formula, which therefore is not a tautology. Here's a more complicated example. This one will turn out to be unsatisfiable. So we begin with those six clauses. And being human beings, we will make our case split on in a fairly random basis. If we were a computer program, we would have very sophisticated heuristics to examine the clauses, the number of occurrences of all the propositional letters, trying to choose one which is used a lot, both positively and negatively, in a lot of short clauses. There's a lot of refinements here, possible heuristics for doing this properly. Here, all I did was say, let's do it on P. What happens if P is true? And what we're going to do here, and of course, we're not a computer, so we're simply going to copy things out. There is no mention of P in this clause, so we copy it down. P is positive in this clause, so we don't copy it. No mention of P here, so we copy it down. P is negated here, so we delete that and copy down the rest. PQ, it mentions P, so we don't copy. Not P, not Q. It has not P, so we delete that and copy down the not Q. What we've got now is easy because we've got a unit clause, namely not Q. So we know what to do. We delete the clause. We delete the positive Qs. We delete this other clause which contains the not Q because we know Q is false. So this, this clause not Q or something else is no longer interesting to us. Now we have an outright contradiction, not R, R, uh, which we can do. In this case, I chose unit clause R, but unit clause not R would be just as good. And we have obtained the empty clause in this case. So, so far we know that P cannot be true. We go to the false case. The reasoning is similar. I won't work through it all in detail. What comes out in the end is another empty clause. So P cannot be true and it cannot be false. Therefore, the original set of clauses is unsatisfiable. And if you don't believe me, you can, of course, try all combinations uh, using truth tables. And this highlights an issue, actually. If DPLL finds a model, it's a very small thing, and it's trivial to check that the model really works. If it does not find a model, you get effectively a proof, and it turns out doing something with this proof, let's say interpreting it through some other kind of logical formalism to show that it really is a proof, is non-trivial. So where are SAT solvers today? As I mentioned, when Resolution came out in 1965, SAT solving, or as it was called then, Davis Putnam, appeared to be dead. When people started playing around with it in, again in the 90s, they were laughed at for a while. But by 2001, at Princeton, they built a thing called ZChaff, using a lot of low-level heuristics. Actually, heuristics is the wrong word. They use some clever coding tricks that betraying a detailed knowledge of things like cache misses in order to make something whose inner loop could run incredibly fast. So don't imagine that the manual copying I just showed you has anything to do with how real SAT solvers run. I believe Zedchaff was retired a long time ago, 
Even so, on computers of that era, let's say up to about 2006, it was already able to solve huge problems in a million variables and 10 million clauses. Um, and remember, the problem we are solving is exponential in the worst case. So if you like, these are the easier problems that are being solved by SAT solvers. Nevertheless, these problems very often have real-world consequences. Some work that was done in the 2000s included taking something like a Microsoft device driver, abstracting out the kinds of simple errors that are made in device drivers, such as grabbing a resource and forgetting to release it, or releasing the same resource twice, both of which could cause a crash. And it turns out one can start with raw C code, and if you're very clever at your abstraction, you can reduce it to a propositional problem, which then, in this case, finding a model means finding an execution path leading to the violation of uh, a Microsoft API. And this made a huge had a huge impact on the reliability of Microsoft Windows and the various device drivers included with it. Today we also have things called SMT solvers. There will be a lecture on that a bit later. SMT refers to satisfiability modulo theories. The idea being to add to SAT solving the ability to talk about arithmetic lists, arrays, and other basic things found in computational contexts. So SAT solving is a very important technology to know about. Now we turn to resolution. I do need to stress, though, that resolution is included here for, shall we say, pedagogical reasons. We don't, no one ever does propositional resolution. It has no value because SAT solving is much better. Nevertheless, we can introduce resolution in the propositional case where things are all a little easier and later we will jack it up to the first order case where it becomes interesting and useful. The resolution rule is simply this line at the top. If we have two clauses which you could write B or A and B, sorry, not B or C, from that we include, we infer A or C. Why does that make sense? Well, it's trivial by case analysis on B. So if B is false, then A must be true. If B is true, then C must be true. So it is a valid inference. If we prefer to write our clauses in set notation, the exact same rule looks like this. I know it looks awfully messy, but it is just what we had above where these sets, remember, are coding our disjunctions. When we have clauses represented by sets, we are looking for a clause that has some literal occurring positively in one clause and negatively in another clause. And what resolution then does is it makes a new clause out of all the remaining literals. Now this may seem a little odd to you, so note that we have two special cases which are particularly important. This first one, if we have a unit clause, then the effect is to delete the negation of that literal. And here you're starting to see something that looks like a SAT solving rule in the case of um, unit propagation, that is the deletion of the negated literal from other clauses. Finally, the way we get a contradiction is if we have two clauses, one asserting B, the other asserting not B, then the result will be a contradiction and resolution will have terminated. 
So let's do a baby example of resolution for this tiny formula there, that is P and Q implies Q and P. Now, let me remind you again, if, a, if you are ever asked to convert an implication into clauses, do it with the help of this trick here. So the way you negate, and I said this in the previous example, the way you negate A implies B is to leave it as A and with the negation of B. So there is the original formula. We put a not sign in front. We use the trick above, which will save you an awful lot of work. The trouble is, you see, if you don't use this trick, then probably you will, you might find yourself pushing the knot very laboriously through the formula A, and then you might find, oh, there's another knot with the implication, and you'll get rid of that implication symbol, and then you'll push another knot laboriously through the formula A, and you will have executed very tediously the identity operation on A. Anyway, here we are. We have assumed P and Q to be true. This will give us clauses P and Q. We negate the conclusion. That will give us not Q or not P, which we can write as a clause. So we can trivially convert the original formula, the negation of it, rather, into clause form. Now resolution on this is trivial. Remember with resolution we are looking for complementary literals. So for example here we have Q, here we have not Q. Also here we have not P, here we have P. This second possibility is the one I seem to be using on the slide. So I resolve this clause here and the literal P with the not P over there, the result of the resolution is it gives us a new clause, namely not Q. Now that we know not Q, and we also know Q, therefore further resolution will give us contradiction. Therefore we have found the contradiction we're looking for. Let's try something a bit more complicated now. This looks like a distributive law for and and or. Once again, we use our trick to convert a big implication into clause form. We're lucky here because, remember, we can assume the left part to be true and the left part is already in conjunctive normal form. It is a conjunction of disjunction of literals. So from the left side of the implication, which we are, remember, trying to negate, we immediately get clauses PQ coming from the P or Q there. We also get a clause PR coming from the P or R there. The right side of the implication needs to be negated the or will become an and, so that's why we get not P as another clause. And when we negate this conjunction, we will get a disjunction of negative literals, which will be not Q, not R. So these four are our clauses. Now again, I wish I could go to the other projector and work this out by hand. I don't have the possibility, but let's just talk through what we would do without necessarily looking further down the slide. We have to look for complementary literals, and you'll see there are many possibilities like R, not R, not Q, Q, not P, P, and there's another P, and so on. And it may seem a bit bewildering that we have so many possibilities to play with. This is, in fact, a real problem in practice and a lot of sophistication was needed to tackle it. But especially if you're trying to do an exam question, please pay attention to your 
shortest clauses, your unit clauses, if you are lucky enough to have some. The shortest clauses are the closest to the empty clause, which, remember, is the point of the whole exercise. So we know not P. We can therefore resolve it over there with the P, and we will then deduce a new clause, namely Q. Again, using our unit clause with the other occurrence of P, we deduce another unit clause, namely R. Things are looking good now. We have got um, we've got three unit clauses. Uh, looking at this, we see we've got a not Q here and a not R there. So with two additional resolution steps, you will get R and with not R, which will be a contradiction. Allow me to caution you. I frequently see students combining resolution steps. You see, they see the Q, the R, the not Q, the not R, and they want to say that's a contradiction in one step. And in fact, it is. But sometimes they do things that are not actually allowed. And in particular, one occasionally sees students thinking they can resolve on two literals between just two clauses and two literals in those clauses at the same time. That is not a valid step, and it is a good way of getting into a lot of trouble. I should mention how the computer deals with the fairly arbitrary process of picking out clauses and somehow trying all combinations and finally getting the empty clause. So there is a thing sometimes called the otter loop, which is quite popular in resolution theorem provers, though with many refinements. We begin by putting all the clauses, that is from the original CNF, into the so-called passive set. There is an active set which is set to empty. And our job is to move clauses from the passive set into the active set. Every time we do this, we take this current clause, the clause we've decided to look at, and we resolve it with every matching active clause. So this is a systematic way of looking at the pairs of clauses that need to be possibly processed. Once you've done this, the result will be a number of new clauses. To ignore step three for the moment. The fourth step is to put all the new clauses that you have produced into the passive set. That is to say, they will be looked at later. Point three is a rather tricky thing, but it is true in a full theorem prover that some of the new things that you will deduce will give you a means of simplifying other clauses, especially if they assert equalities. I don't want to go too far into that. It is not something that we will be looking at here. Now, this simple loop, we just keep repeating. There's only two ways to terminate. One, of course, if you find the empty clause, then you're finished. If you like, it is the golden snitch of our Quidditch match. Another possibility is that the passive set will become empty. In that case, we have to give up and we have not found a proof. There is, of course, other possibilities such as running out of storage and running out of time, which, of course, are also unsuccessful. Here is the same thing as a diagram. So you see our problem our set of clauses is added to this set. And now at every step, what do we do? Are there any clauses? If not, we give up. But if there is a clause and we have to select one carefully using heuristics, we add it to the set of active clauses. 
and we perform all possible inferences between this selected clause and the active clauses. So all possible resolution steps are now tried. New clauses are deduced. Possibly some simplification takes place. Now we have a new, newly generated clauses, newly produced by inference. If one of them is empty, we are finished. If not, they go back into the passive set and we continue. Now, resolution got a bad name pretty quickly after it was introduced. People had these dreams of being able to turn the handle, as they like to say, and have theorems pop out for free. This almost never happened, so there were there was a huge effort put into various tricks to make it work better. One of the most important ones is the clause selection. That is to say, which clause do we try next in order to combine with other clauses? So the idea of introducing weights, the idea that some constants were bad, typically because they were very tricky to reason about and that if you had them in your problem, you were in a bad way and your whole point was to eliminate these constants and ultimately that would lead to a proof. So you would assign these weights. So the higher the number, the worse the constant would be. And you could then, by adding up the weights of all the constants in a clause, you would get the weight of the clause. Note, of course, that we are trying to focus towards the empty clause, which necessarily has a weight of zero because it doesn't have any constants in it. But a clause with relatively few literals would also have a lighter weight than other clauses that were longer and therefore had more occurrences of constants. So by carefully assigning weights, one could, this would be one way of guiding the search in the direction that you want, eliminating constants that you really aren't happy to see and replacing them by perhaps larger expressions but containing nicer constants. This is one powerful heuristic for guiding the proof. I need to mention completeness, however. Remember, in both propositional and first-order logic, resolution is complete, which means if your formula is valid, then a proof will definitely be found in finite time. Providing, of course, you have unlimited time and memory, which we never do in practice. So completeness really is something of a theoretical property. The fact that you will get the theorem after waiting 10 to the 35th years is not that useful from a practical point of view. Nevertheless, people working in this field attach considerable importance to completeness, and certainly you wouldn't want to make some stupid error that would cause a lot of relatively easy proof to somehow be overlooked. If we want completeness, then this clause selection process needs to be fair. That is to say, it should never be possible for a particular clause to be deferred, delayed for selection forever. There are many other heuristics. One I should mention is the so-called ordering heuristics. When we looked even at the trivial example we saw before, there were many, many pairs of complementary literals. And if you think about it, or if you try a few examples, you'll see that these cause enormous symmetries in any resolution proof. That is to say, you could have resolved on P now and Q later, or Q now and P later, and you end up doing exactly the same things. So it turns out that you can impose an ordering constraints on the set of clauses, on the literals, which have the effect of prohibiting almost all of the resolution steps 
And when you then do the few that are allowed to you, you find that the amount of search is greatly reduced because there's really only a few things you can do. And these alternate proof paths have been eliminated. There are many other techniques. Subsumption is where when you deduce the clause PQ, for example, you would delete all other clauses containing P, Q, and other literals. The reason being that if the clause P or Q was true, and by putting it in your set of clauses you're asserting it's true, then something like P, Q, R is automatically true as well and therefore redundant. Subsumption, unfortunately, requires a lot of sophistication to do efficiently, which leads us to yet another of the heuristics here, the design of very elaborate data structures that allow complementary literals to be found, orderings to be respected, and subsumption to be done. It's also possible, and it can pay off, if you invest a big effort into pre-processing, which is to say simplifying the problem before you even get started.